Hey everybody, welcome to the Big Flop by Spark Indonesia with me, Gianca. And me, Bill. Today we've got a very special guest for our first episode, a sharp and intelligent woman, <laughs> Felicia Gawilarang. Yay. Hi, Felicia. Hi, everyone. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us here today. So you mind kicking us off with um, how are you doing and uh, what are you doing now? Okay, cool. So I'm the VP of marketing at HelloDoc, and basically I lead all of HelloDoc's marketing efforts from digital to website uh, to all of our ATL and BTL activities. Um, so right now, obviously, I have my hands full with a lot of our uh, COVID-19 initiatives. Um, so that's what I've been busy with lately. Awesome. Sounds energy draining, <laughs> <laughs> but very, very cool. Yeah. So we read quite a bit about you, that's why, and we're very interested in your background and what you're doing now, that's why we've um, asked you to come on board. And so um, I think you studied um, finance in uh, university, back in university, correct? Yes, I majored in finance at Boston University. Nice, correct. nice. I went to Boston too, by the way. Yay. <laughs> oh, really? Where did you go? I went Where'd to Babson. I went to Babson. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. It's kind of outside of Boston. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's only a little bit outside of Boston. My, right? <laughs> my sister, my sister, my sister went to Babson. Oh, yeah, yeah. I Chestnut Hill, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, I think after you graduated, you work at uh, Accenture for a bit and uh, financial services. So, also in the realm of finance, correct? Uh, yeah, so after I graduated uh, BU, I went to uh, consulting mm -hmm. um, because, I, I mean, naturally, that's what you do after you graduated oh, yeah, uh, from as a finance major, mm -hmm. especially like back in my day. I sound really old saying that, <laughs> um, but we were when we when we majored in finance, we used to do consulting or investment banking. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's considered a successful track path. Right. So I went into the consulting track. And I ended up in Accenture uh, doing consulting for uh, financial services like banks. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So what made you want to switch from um, finance to marketing? And uh, I think you went um, to VML first before going to Hollow Dog. And then how did you, you know, finally end up in Hollow Dog? Just curious to know. Okay, so I thought, like, honestly, finance has never been for me, uh, <laughs> even from when I was majoring it at school. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I didn't take marketing was because all the smart kids took finance. And I was like, okay, like, I, I didn't want to go on a marketing path. I, I was like, okay, I want to be successful, so maybe I should just take finance. So to be honest, it was more like that kind of external pressure that made me take finance in the first place, but right. my heart was never really in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been passionate about communication, design, and marketing. Um, ever since I, I was very young. And so naturally, once I decided to join consulting and after a year and a half, two years, I decided my heart's really not in this job. It felt really like a job <laughs> every day. It was like 7 a.m. So 9 p.m. as right. consulting hours are. <laughs> um, and yes. I was just like dreading uh, my day to day because like, I, there was no passion in my job. Um, so I decided like, okay, before I kind of waste my life away, I should think about what kind of passion and what I wanted to, what I want to do in life. And the first thing I thought of was obviously marketing. Um, I always wanted to do marketing. Uh, so I contacted someone, um, Piot, who is the director at that time for VML, a digital agency. Mm -hmm. And Piot's actually uh, an alumni from GIS that I know. Uh, so I told Piat, like, listen, I have no background in marketing, but I've always been really passionate about it. Um, so give me a job. Like, I don't mind starting over <laughs> as a junior member, uh, but I really want to learn about the ins and outs of digital marketing, uh, what it's like to work in an agency. Um, and luckily I passed. <laughs> so I passed the interview uh, with zero marketing background. Um, <laughs> And I joined the digital agency. I worked on a lot of different brands uh, like Danone. I worked on uh, Spotify. Wow. Uh, so I got a lot of cool, I think I got a lot of do a lot of cool digital branding um, activities right. when I was there. Um, 
But then <laughs> after a few years went by, I was looking for something that had more of a mission. Um, so I got my background that I wanted in marketing and I felt like, okay, I know the ins and outs already, mm-hmm. um, but I felt like something was still missing. Like I definitely loved my job and I thought it was very interesting, but I felt like I wanted to do something that could make a difference in the world. And I really wanted to make a difference in Indonesia. Um, and that's when I coincidentally met John Sudarta, who is the CEO of Halodoc. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously healthcare is something that's very needed in Indonesia. Uh, I think, I mean, all of you must know that here, a lot of people, especially at our level, biasanya, kalau misalnya we go, we are sick, we go to Singapore, right? We don't trust our doctors here. (laughs) We don't trust the hospitals here. (laughs) Um, So I wanted to do something in terms of how do I, how do we make healthcare more trustworthy? And two, how do we simplify healthcare with technology? Um, And that's why I joined the Holodoc team. So you came into Holodoc with this, um, really mission to like good for for good positive social impact didn't you yes um so it's not it wasn't a csr initiative Mm -hmm. um i don't i don't i i do believe csr is important but i don't believe csr is big enough to make a huge impact when it comes to change right i do think like change and uh change in terms of using technology something like gojek or holodoc requires obviously an actual business um, to be, you know, to have someone working for it, uh, still making profit, have it a proper business, but it's something that society really needs. Um, so that's what Haldok was about, basically. Till today, our uh, tagline is still simplifying healthcare. Uh, what we want to do is basically get, you know, a doctor in your hands in 10 seconds, a medicine by your doorstep within 30 minutes. Um, and so anything that we think is a problem in healthcare in Indonesia, we will we, we, we'll try to solve. Awesome. So like listening to your story, everything seems to be very, you know, serendipitous. Your crossover from finance to marketing and even uh, the crossover from uh, Holodoc itself is a crossover of, you know, healthcare and digital technology. And for most people, crossovers might not be as smooth as it seems, isn't it? So uh, could you share with us if there was ever uh, a flop experience that you had, um, whether it's a failure or a missed opportunity and how did it happen? Um, I think, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it, it, a lot of it, it was very serendipitous. And, but I think a lot of it is because I I'd never back away from a challenge. Um, if I want to do something, I jump right ahead and do it. Um, and I take on the challenges head on. Uh, so in that sense, I felt like, obviously with anything that you do, especially when you're new, um, there's going to be a lot of challenges. Like for example, when I first started Hello Doc, uh, one of the biggest challenges was one, I had zero idea about healthcare, like zero. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't even go to the doctor. Um, I, I, I've barely gone to any hospital to Indonesia. I get my yearly checkup in Singapore. Um, and I'm like, I was like 24, 25 when I started Holodoc. Wow. Uh, and obviously at that age, like even at my age right now, and you're, we don't really get too sick enough to be going to the pharmacy at a very regular basis. Mm-hmm. So like, I don't know any medicines. I didn't know any hospitals, doctors, just even the basics, I had no idea, right? So just starting from scratch well, is difficult. Um, especially in an industry like like health, because there's so much to it, right? And there's so many different layers to healthcare that you need to understand, especially when you want to change it for the better. So learning that itself was hard. Two, I was very young. Um, I was appointed the VP of marketing at 24, 25 years old. And um, uh, it was a very small company though. So my title meant nothing at that time. <laughs> I led a team of six people, I think five or six people, but basically less than 10. Um, so it didn't, it didn't mean like I was an actual VP, especially at a small startup. Um, but I felt it was difficult because I had to lead a lot of members on my team who are actually older than me. Um, mm-hmm and basically revamp and teach them about digital marketing, right? Uh, So the people that I took over at that time, a lot of them didn't have the background in digital agency and most of them had background maybe in health. 
Um, so just making them respect me, getting other people to see my point of view um, in a good light, just because of the age gap is also difficult, I think. But that's something that I still experience today, uh, I feel. Uh, I think, um, I guess, with the topic of women in tech and just, I'm 29 years old right now. Uh, I lead a team of eight, uh, 75 people in marketing. Wow. Um, I work I work with mostly men. Um, under me, there's a lot of women in marketing, but as a peer, there's only one other VP who is a woman. Um, the rest are men and an industry, especially in the tech industry, I think you're always going to be surrounded by a lot more men. Um, mm -hmm. That's That in itself, is a difficulty to overcome, I guess, uh, because I think, you know, the point of view will be different, the way people look at you, the way the different respect showed. Um, so that I, I think it's also a challenge. So you talked uh, about, you know, having uh, working with a lot of men and the industry and uh, the challenges that comes with it. But how, how do you overcome those challenges? How do you gain their respect? Um, I think number one is having self-confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, just because someone at first maybe not doesn't really respect you or kind of look down in your ability, um, it doesn't mean that it's true. And mm -hmm. I think the number one thing you should have is self-confidence to overcome that. Like instead of mm -hmm. backing down and being like, okay, maybe I can't do it. Maybe he's right or maybe she's right or whatever. You should have succumbed to other people's judgment, right? So I think number one is to have that self-confidence to overcome that. Um, and then prove yourself, right? Um, prove that prove that you're smart enough, work hard enough, so that people know and around you. I think the work itself speaks volumes, right? Um, so to be honest, how I overcame it was, yeah, pede <laughs> I had confidence in my abilities. I had confidence in what I can do. So I believe that um, the longer they work with me, the more they will respect me and the work that I do. Which which obviously ended up to be true because. I mean, now I'm at a hollow dog and it's been five years and thankfully it's it's worked out pretty well. That's amazing. And that's actually really great advice. Um, but do you do you think that people actually treat you uh, differently in the workplace uh, as, as a female leader um, before, you know, when you just first started out? Um, well, I think 100 percent the answer is yes. Mm. Uh, <laughs> It's unfortunate, but I think, especially in Indonesia, um, like workplace kind of like sexual differentiation is still very, and I would say sexism is still very much alive. Oh, yeah. um, I wouldn't say that, like, I think in a startup like Holodoc, it's better because obviously like you're with like-minded people, right? Mm -hmm. Like startups usually come, it's more younger people, people are more open-minded, people yeah. want to change. But for example, when I was working in like banking or in consulting, and I would be in an industry that's more traditional, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you will see that there's a lot of just even small comments about like how you look today. For me, it's already inappropriate, right? Like I'm not going to go around to a male colleague and be like, oh, you look super hot today. <laughs> Like, yeah, I feel yeah. like that's so inappropriate, right? <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, girls get that comment all the time, right? And and from su supervisors as well, right? Like, I'm at the VP of marketing. I'm not going to go to an intern and be like, oh, you look good today. Like, like in a way that's I feel like it's inappropriate. But unfortunately, that happens all the time to women, right? Mm -hmm. Like, just small comments. Oh, like, oh, why are you so dressed up today? Oh, why is your skirt so short? Or why is your hair so nice? Why are you wearing so much makeup? Those kind of things, I think most women have experienced in the mm. workplace and just small things like that in itself is already sexism actually yeah yeah for sure yeah. Mm. you see there's there's also the, all these pre-existing issues in the workplace for women and you know given your high position uh, everything even with the pandemic aside must be hectic but with the <laughs> current conditions right now with you know new programs quick turnarounds how have you transition into that and how did you know um what to do when something's not going right and how do you make sure that things can be readjusted re-strategized uh so oh yeah of course with the pandemic a lot of things had to change um especially in the beginning right like last year i, I think it's exactly one year ago um, when everything had to shut down and we all had to work from home 
I think number one thing that's difficult is, okay, how do we make sure everyone stays productive, right? Yeah. Um, especially if I, I lead such a large team, how do I make sure everyone is doing their job, no one is slacking out? Um, so I think putting that into place in itself is already difficult, like a lot of internal um, just management. And then two, obviously, uh, we were supposed to launch our appointment service last year for hospital appointments, which around this time, April, we had like a press conference ready. Um, and we had everything set up or roadmap for it. But obviously, because of COVID, we couldn't send people to the hospitals, especially if they didn't have COVID, because one, the hospitals had to prioritize COVID patients. And two, right. um, it, it was just too dangerous, right? Like we didn't want people to be crowding around the hospital waiting for a doctor if they didn't need to. So we quickly pivoted our appointment service for appointments for COVID-19 testing. Um, so now, I don't know if you know, but we have appointments to go to drive through mm -hmm. uh, both mm -hmm. for COVID-19 testing, like PCR, rapid antigen, and now for obviously vaccination. So we also have a drive through vaccination site now. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think you're the first to do that here, actually, right? Correct. We were the first to do it for uh, drive through both actually COVID-19 testing and vaccinations in Jakarta. Uh, yeah, that's really, really cool. I'll be honest. I actually once used your service for like a PCR test at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> thank, it was convenient. Thank, thank you for your business. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when we're talking about healthcare and, and, you know, bringing, as you said, you wanted to be able to bring a positive impact for people, even though it's not a CSR mode, but there's always been this debate of like, Healthcare always taking advantage of people. Healthcare always being so costly. How do you see yourself as a marketer, as a person who's working for a health services company, selling that to people? Um, actually, in Indonesia, there's not there is not too much negative uh, perspective. I think in terms of health, in terms of health care providers taking money from you, I feel like that's a very U.S. Uh, <laughs> uh, base perspective um, that, oh, you know, your insurers, your health hospitals or your pharmaceuticals, big pharma is out to get your money. I feel like that's more a, a, an American mindset. Uh, in Indonesia, people don't see healthcare that way um, in terms of taking profit from you. Right. But they do think one, it is kind of expensive, but they don't think there it's because like, oh, people are trying to take your money. Uh, and two, uh, they do think it takes time a lot of time. Uh, so I think uh, the number one challenges we face with Indonesians and healthcare is that one, sebenarnya is none of the above. It's not the money, it's not the time, mm -hmm. is that Indonesians takut dokter. <laughs> they don't like doctors. <laughs> <laughs> like, Kenapa they just don't like hospitals. <laughs> they don't like going to doctors. So when Indonesians get sick, when we, for survey, the number one thing they do is they ask their moms, Kaya, what do you think I'm sick with? Yeah. Or they ask their friends, right? They consult with each other, kaya, the community. Gitu kan? Jadi misalnya, I have the flu. Um, or like, oh, you know, kaya, oh, I have a runny nose, I have a stomach ache. What do you take? Like, what medicine do you take? And then I just buy it myself in the pharmacy. Like, you're not a doctor, but I trust you. And you were healed with whatever you took. So I'm going to take what you take, right? And actually, that's the number one behavior we see in Indonesia. Um, that people... Uh, get their health consultation from their friends. And this is the behavior that we wanted to change in the beginning, right? So a lot of our campaigns in the beginning was, oh, don't consult with your mom, don't <laughs> consult with your friends, consult with a doctor who went to school and know what he's talking about, right, what she's talking right. about, right? <laughs> um, so a lot of our campaigns when we first started was, oh, trust your doctor, you know, um, we have a doctor right in your hand as well, who can be your mom, your friend, uh, except that he's a professional. <laughs> um, so he probably knows better, right? So so we had to do a lot of awareness campaign around that in the beginning. Yeah. Hmm. Kasian juga dokter, kuliah lama-lama tapi gak didatengin ya. <laughs> <laughs> Go to mom. <laughs> Usually, yeah, if, especially if you're not super yeah. sick. People go to a doctor after, misalnya, after two weeks, you still haven't been healed. Then you start panicking, right? And then you're like, oh my God, like, what's wrong with me? Do I have cancer? Do I have this? Do I have this? And then you're like, okay, I need to go see a doctor. But anything usually kind of mild, people don't go to a doctor for. Okay. Um, so just to kind of back paddle a little bit, um, you 
first led like a team of six, you said, and then now it's a team of 75. That's just amazing. Um, how do you think your leadership style has changed from when you were leading a small team versus now leading such a big team? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely when I was leading a team of six, I had to be part of a team member, right? Mm. Like I couldn't just lead and manage right. um, because obviously uh, this company was still small, there's not enough people. So I was very involved in the day to day, just like anything, job and comments on social media, uh, you know, being the jazz in case there's an emergency <laughs> posting. Um, I was very involved in like every single creative that we post on Instagram, right? Like every single one I went through, um, I edited, I commented. So just like all the detailed work, Dulu, I was very involved. Like every single thing I could be involved in, right? But now that I'm leading a bigger team, obviously that wouldn't be productive <laughs> if I had to be involved in every single thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so leading a bigger team means I have to set up also manager levels, right? Like people right. who are under me, but also leaders. Um, and so now that I lead a bigger team, one, obviously making sure I set up leadership under me who can lead the team without me always micromanaging them. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of my work now revolves around managing my managers versus <laughs> being involved in the super detailed day-to-day -day work. Cool. And um, what challenges do you face? Like, how, how are the challenges like, different in like, managing um, your managers versus actually doing uh, you know, all that hard work yourself? To be honest, obviously the job is harder now. <laughs> <laughs> how so? How I think so? I think people underestimate um, how difficult it is to people manage people. Like people management is one oh. of the toughest thing because there's not one set solution, right? Like, for example, if you're going to you have a marketing strategy and you want to post something, there's usually a clear cut answer to mm -hmm. what is good and what is bad, right? But with people management, it really depends on like who you're leading. You know, um, you need to have different strategies to manage different types of people. And then not only do you have to lead your managers, but your managers have to lead their team as well. Right. So also helping them become good managers who can also handle and um, you know manage and lead different types of people under them. Um, so that in itself, I think, is quite difficult because there's not one thing you can read, one person you can talk to to basically help solve your problems, right? right kind of problems, right. yeah, banyak dari, okay, A nga suka B, or someone doesn't want to work on this team, or for example, um, there's too much work for one person, there's not enough work for another person. There's all these different issues that arises um, just from managing people on a day-to-day -day basis. So you really um, set the tone, don't you, for, for the, uh, however they would run themselves? How you correct, interact with them would affect how they interact with people under them as the well? Team. Correct. So, of course, um, I have to lead by example yeah. um, so that they can also, you know, mm. lead the way I want them to lead, right? Felicia, um, I guess part of leading a team is also yes. about, like, um, you know, making sure that everybody you work with share the same vision as you, right? Um, would you agree mm -hmm. that that's uh, a part of it or a major part of it? Well, that's definitely a major part of it because if you don't have the same vision, uh, you won't be aligned and you might be working on different things. Um, so I think that definitely number one is getting people on the same page, mm -hmm. making sure they know what our you know, company vision is for the year is, what our focus for the quarter is. Uh, that's something we still struggle with, struggle with, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, why we struggle with it is because, you know, the company grows so fast as well. And the team also grows just as fast, right? right. And making sure that it doesn't just stop halfway. Because sometimes I will say to my managers, and then my manager will say to someone right under them, tapi yang paling bawah mungkin masih nggak terlalu jelas kan? Karena the message has yeah. been passed down berapa level, right? So I think we still struggle with right. that in terms of getting making sure everyone benar-benar kayak ngerti uh, what our roadmap is for the year and the reason why we want to go there. 
because usually right. I will say something long and it'll get shortened and shortened and shortened. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, then by yeah. the time it gets to someone like very, very on the maybe entry level, oh, kaya, it's just one like one yeah, sentence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, intinya targetnya revenue gitu. Padahal <laughs> kaya, oh, the reason why it's revenue is because yeah. of this, 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 this. Tapi by the time it gets to them, it's just, you know what, we only care about profit and, you know, the reasoning and why we're working on it, it doesn't translate. Mm. Um, that's something I think we still tr- struggle with today. I see. It's like one of those games of like, you know, whisper. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was just about to yeah. say that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Apple becomes, I don't know, orange. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally different thing. Um, but yeah, do, you, do you think that uh, most people or, or maybe even everybody that works at the Doc? Uh, wants to create an impact? Is that why they work at Hollow Dock? I think the majority of people, um, definitely, especially on a lead, like on a manager and up level, mm-hmm. parts of the job and parts of the reason why they stay is because they can see and know that there's impact, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's definitely number one, yes. Cool. So I think, I don't know if this is true, but what I've noticed is that Um, people of our generation, the younger generation, is um, more, I guess, keen on working towards impact and uh, adding value towards society, whereas, you know, the older generation is less so. Um, do you do you agree that that's the case? And if so, if you do agree, um, why do you think that is? Sorry, can you repeat the first part? Most people are... Yeah, most people in, uh, in our generation, the younger generations, uh, everybody's more keen towards working for a cause or like creating an impact or adding value towards society. Whereas, you know, people of the older generation, they're, you know, not as interested in that. Um, I don't know if that's a uh, uh, fact, but that's what I see, I think, in my opinion, that, that that's the case. Um, do you, do you I, think that's I the think, case? I think. I think it's not, I think, I think not everyone in our generation, I don't think wants to work for a cause, but mm. I think right now that's what's trendy or, or that's what's admired, right? Mm. People who believe in causes, people not just working for a cause, but also if you believe in a cause and you're fighting for a cause, you might not be working for that cause, but on the side, you're kind of like supporting this cause, you know, there's charities and causes that you back, you back with money or with movement. Um, and I think that's something that society looks up to now, right? Especially, um, you know, just having an opinion and making sure like, for example, global warming, uh, female, gender in- gender equality, there's all these different causes, right? Like mm-hmm. saving the mantas or <laughs> uh, saving the forest. <laughs> like, I feel like it's really important to um, right now that people always look up to other people who support causes or mm-hmm. are very passionate about the cause that you know they're fighting for but i do not agree that you know everyone i know is working for a cause because it's just not true right um not everyone i know wants to work for a cause or cares too much about causes that be if you look at it and from a higher level it does seem like right now what's being uh, what people look up to and what seems like the society standard is is for people to have causes and you know make positive impact and that's something that's i think just new during our generation um versus our parents generation I, yeah th- i think i see that there's this um like, like a just juxtaposition like on one side there's like a privilege of youth you have the time you have the energy right you're still young you can take risks and just experiment with whatever causes you want but at the same time we're living in a, a very metric bound kind of mm-hmm. a- generation Everyone's obsessing over like, what, 30 over, 30 under 30? 30 under 30. 30 under 30. 30 under 30. 30 under 30. Have you, like, was there ever a moment in your life where, in your career, where you were thinking, I need to be somewhere before 30. I need to be there. 30 by, 30 by 30 under 30. <laughs> I need to be there. Is there? Never. There, Actually, never? I've never even applied to 30 under 30. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, just, I, I, I think. At least for me, it's more important that your work speaks for you, right? I really hate people who sure. do a lot of speaking events or podcasts. And but Ooh. if you just <laughs> kind of like on their, well, no, 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 not not you guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, yeah. there's people 
in the industry where you know they haven't really done much but they do a lot of talking versus right, working right. and i think there needs to be a balance between that um <laughs> and you know some people i just i, I like pref- like the branding too much i guess like the personal branding that's just my take mm-hmm. um so i don't think external validation especially like getting into a list should be something that's at the top of what makes you or you think your career a success right i think you should focus on your career and if someone else recognizes it then that's good for you right it means you're making an impact and you're doing something that deserves recognition versus chasing that recognition and not focusing on what you're doing yeah, yeah. so how do you measure that personally for you what does impact mean to you and success mean to you do you consider yourself right now impactful successful um i I'm, i'm happy with where i am obviously i'm someone who's also quite ambitious but i don't measure i don't measure it in terms of oh numbers or or where am i in terms of like salary or mm-hmm. if i got into a list this year or did not get into a list <laughs> this year um i think for me the more important thing is am i happy with the growth that my career is giving me so if i think i'm still learning from my job and i'm still happy um because i'm learning every day and it's helping me grow into a better leader and i'm learning new things all the time that for me is already enough and um, that means i'm happy and content with where my career is going right what i don't want is being stuck in a job where i feel like i know everything and nothing is kind of new to me and there's no more challenges and there's nothing to battle um and i think that's why for me it's one i moved to haldok because i think there's impact and two you know there's always challenges and there's always new things that we need to be solving all the time right we i mean we're always trying to innovate for solutions for healthcare um and there's as you know there's many many problems in the industry that we need to be solving so i think right now that's that's how i personally measure um success or in terms of happiness in a career right is the impact and the challenges it gives me and to make sure that i continue to grow i think that's awesome i yeah. think not not putting yourself on on a number i think that's great not i don't i don't think a lot of people can do that right because we always we're the most harshest critic we towards ourselves <laughs> for sure yes, a lot yeah. of people say that yeah <laughs> <laughs> so like if there's one key takeaway uh to leaders whether they're in a company leading a startup or trying to make a positive change from what you've said to us shared to us today what would be that one te- one takeaway I think like one takeaway would be try to look for something that you know really gives fire like inside you right that's something you mm. really want to work for um and I think n- not to be too bothered about external influence because like for example I do think now startup and tech is kind of hot and a lot of people want to be in it without right. re- without thinking about okay what companies do I want to go into you know what startup do I want to work for well, you know startup is like is it there's a lot of industries in startups right oh, yeah. there's not just it's not a, a startup itself is not an industry right there's a healthcare <laughs> startup there's e-commerce you know there is there's a lot of different startups and um you can't just say because I sometimes talk to young people and a lot of them just like oh boy yeah I want to work in a startup like it doesn't seem to matter like whatever that thing is <laughs> as long as it's startup and it's in tech right which for me is so silly because like okay but then you know a fine that could be a finance startup right the, you know like coinbase is a finance startup um <laughs> but that's not, if that's not your interest that that shouldn't be something that you should be doing just because it's a startup right so i think you know making sure that you know what you actually want and not to be too influenced you know by external factors that's awesome that's cool that's, that's cool. so nice yeah. all right well Thank you so much Felicia for being our first guest. Yay. We're happy to have you. It's <laughs> Thank such you guys. cool insights. Do you have any hopes or messages that you want to convey to the listeners? Oh. 
not any extra ones, I guess. <laughs> I guess my, my, <laughs> my last was one was, yeah, yeah, that was, I felt like my last message, <laughs> what, yeah, what I talked about just now that. was the last climax. hope and message just mm. for it. Yes. Fighting. <laughs> but yeah, definitely yes. find your passion and um, just keep, don't yeah. let other people influence Don't you. Don't let other mm. people too much. influence you. Yep. Too much. Yep. Too much. Facts. Facts. When they are right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. I guess that's it. That's it. I yeah. think that's a wrap for our very first episode. You guys don't have like a closing thing. You should do like a closing segment. What do you think it should be like? What do you think it should like, sound like? You know, you like? guys should put a thing together like, oh, thank you so much to everyone. And like, you know. well, I think we should have like a, like, oh. Like, well, like, what's your closing sentence? Um, See you on the flip side. Or the flop side. <laughs>